think maybe more accurate to say um, the Humanity Center has been a friend to me. <laughs> um, I look at these brown bags as a place to um, try out work that I then take on the road. Uh, so my, the, um, some of you were at the um, April brown bag on alphabets, and I brought that to Edinburgh for the Material Cultures Conference. And um, this paper um, will find its way to the MLA in January. You all are my toughest audience, <laughs> so so uh, once I get through uh, this gauntlet, those other conferences are always a breeze. So thank you, Walter, for the opportunity. So um, if you'll bear with me, I want to start my presentation on an 18th century bookseller with a 21st century question. Can you write on your Kindle? I hope you have one. Sure, you can highlight, place some bookmarks, make a few notes, and maybe if you're very subversive, you might just use that tiny keyboard to write the great American novel. If you, if you do that, you can even share it on Twitter. But let's look at how the Kindle understands itself. First, its maker and its marketer primarily a, um, and best know, is primarily and best known as a retail bookseller. In a five-minute promotional video on Amazon.com, which I won't bore you with, <laughs> Three whole seconds are devoted to annotation, that is, to readers writing. Its interface is similarly skewed. Granted, it does have a keyboard, as you can see here, um, but a tiny one, obviously not uh, ergonomically suited for composing at any length. The notes one does take are hidden away from the main text. Its other features and functions tell the same story. You know the spiel. The specially lit screen and patented e-ink allow you to read it on the beach. Um, it's lightweight means you can travel with your library, you can purchase and download books at the speed of light, access all your favorite newspapers, and so on. In all these many ways, then, the Kindle is represented as a reading machine. Now, this is okay. I don't have anything against the Kindle, the Nook, iPad, or any other e-reader, and I'm not here to say they are better or worse than old-fashioned print books, which certainly have their limitations as well. What I am interested in exploring today is how and when reading became so disaggregated from writing. This is something that an English department should know something about, right? We teach literature, we teach culture, and we teach composition. We show students how to read closely and carefully, whether the analyzed text is a novel, an advertisement, a poem, or the diary of a 17th century bureaucrat. <coughs> we also teach students how to make text whether that produced text is a research paper, a literary analysis, a website, or a YouTube video. What you may not know, and I, I think many people are from English here, so we know, is that English departments usually maintain two separate groups of faculty, literary and cultural studies and composition and rhetoric, to do what is, with some notable and important but rare exceptions, considered two very different tasks. At many large schools, in fact, rhetoric and writing programs have split off to become completely separate departments. Now, I'm not the first to notice this or to wonder about its history. The split is usually attributed to Hugh Blair in the publication of his le lectures on rhetoric and belles lettres. Published in 1785, though written 20 years earlier as lectures in his position as professor of rhetoric at the University of Edinburgh. Blair, one of the late 18th century's most influential pedagogues and a landmark theorist in the history of rhetoric, is credited with transforming the focus of rhetoric from one who invents to one who receives. Because of Blair, it is said, the study of rhetoric shifted from a generative to an analytical art. Consolidating the century's earlier work on the construction of middle class taste and discernment, most explicitly set forth by Addison and Steele, and reacting to the practical curriculums for tradesmen and merchants being delivered in dissenting academies, Blair explicitly sets forth the supposition that the study of literature needs to extend beyond providing models for future composing. While acknowledging the use of writing in some professions, he explains that, quote, others without any prospect of this kind may wish only to improve their taste with respect to writing and discourse and to acquire principles which will enable them to judge for themselves in that part of literature called the belle lettre. This is a critical shift. Far from supplying only instruction in writing, Blair's lectures were pivotal in creating reading. Certainly Blair was not singular in his approach, but was joined by other educational theorists and cultural critics who were keynotes in the construction of this new educational paradigm. 
Indeed, Blair's lectures themselves are really a synthesis and consolidation of century-long discussions. However, another force besides that of pedagogues, estheticians, and, century, uh, and literary apologists needs to be taken into consideration in understanding the development of the new theories. Students need to be able to learn to analyze text so they could ascertain which were the best, filled with the most delightful, uh, delightful beauties and figures, the most instructive moral sentiments, the most vigorous representations of authorial genius. The reason that the best was not obvious was that there were just so many books, so many writers of all classes, positions, and genders, so many new readers, so much print. These new pedagogies derive in part from an overwhelming sense of information overload, which I think might sound familiar to us. But if print is the problem motivating this new pedagogy of proper appreciation, it also turns out to be the cure. By print, I should clarify, I don't mean an essentialized form that is constant and unchanging. I don't mean the usual representations of print as a medium that is always standardized, linear, fixed, immutable. Print is a medium, of course, though not one that is stable or monolithic, as some would have us believe. It is also a technology and a trade. Print is a process, really, a political and cultural enactment by a variety of individual agents, printers, booksellers, writers, readers, who in conjunction with machines and within some set material determinants, through their creative collaborations and economic relationships, create a multiplicity of meanings for that very term, print. Thus in my process of examining the role of this technology slash medium slash economic force in shaping education, I want to be very specific. And so let me introduce you to one bookseller, Robert Dodsley, and one book, The Preceptor, first published in 1748. It is hard to encapsulate in a few lines how central Dodsley was to the print market of his period. But I'll try. Being a bookseller in 18th century parlance meant more than just owning a shop. And function the job was comparable to today's publisher, uh, with the addition of managing retail operations. As the entrepreneurial and impresarios of the Enlightenment, booksellers originated ideas for new projects, hired writers or wrote themselves, served as editors, anthologizers, scholarly supervisors, and literary historians, worked with printers, entered into partnerships with other booksellers, supervised distribution, often both at the wholesale and retail levels, and ran their own shops. Dodsley, a footman with a yen for writing, came to the attention of Alexander Pope, who introduced him to friends in the book trade. He published some of his own poems in a successful play, and then, without rising through the usual trade ranks of apprentice and journeyman, opened his shop at the sign of Tully's Head in 1735. He published The Late Pope, the first works of Thomas Gray, Stephen Duck, Edward Young, as well as numerous other poets and essayists who were the bright lights of their period. He produced works in the areas of science, religion, and travel, brought out translations of the classics and recent foreign authors, and supervised several well-respected periodicals. He served literary history in a couple key ways as well. His A Collection of Poems by Several Hands consolidated his publishing of contemporary writers to fill eventually six volumes, the major and many minor voices of his era. With his collection of old plays, he reached back through time and almost single-handedly recovered the lost gems of the Tudor and Restoration stage, filling 12 volumes with 61 plays. He is probably most famous, however, for his lasting partnership with Samuel Johnson, who affectionately called him Dotty, my patron. It was Dodsley who originated the idea for what has come to be called Johnson's Dictionary, arranged for its financing and marketing, and, and encouraged and prodded his flagging lexographer as needed. But it, thus it is no exaggeration when Dodsley's uh, biographer sums up, quote, by 1748, through his power in the world of print, Dodsley had initiated canon-making texts at the level of the individual word, the individual literary work, and at the level of the entire curriculum of knowledge, the preceptor. The DMB continues the praise, noting that in the 1750s, Dodsley became the London publisher of Belle Dutch, and that his shop at Tully's Head was the, quote, fashionable gathering place of London's literati. Given Dodsley's wide-ranging influence in the construction